What is up? And welcome back to Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. I am back and better than ever. It feels good to be back. I survived March Madness and my dog having better brackets than me. I survived the bridge run. Just feels great to be here again. Hope you all had a wonderful Easter weekend. Let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, so I'm going to make a wild assumption here and guess that by now, you are well aware of everything surrounding LSU's national championship game win, most notably LSU's Angel Reese taunting Caitlin Clark of Iowa at the end of the game. And I sat down to make notes for this episode a million times because there was so much about it that I wanted to discuss from the ethics of taunting to how we treat women athletes compared to how we treat men to the obvious racial dynamics at play. Just a million different factors and I couldn't ever get my head right to talk about any of them. So I had to zoom out. What was the thing that connected all of this? From start to finish, what was the common denominator? Well, Pew Research released an impeccably timed study about the demographics of journalism last week that showed that 83% of sports journalists identified as male and 82% of sports journalists identified as white. Now, we knew this was the case when we saw everyone referring to the taunt in question as the John Cena when it's clearly the Tony Yayo. As someone who bought the G-Unit shoes in high school, I cannot stand for that kind of erasure. But back to journalism. Journalism at its core is storytelling. And storytelling is a big part of what makes us humans. It's how we connect with each other. It's how we entertain. It's how we learn. It's how we share information. It's crucial to who we are. And no matter how you think people came to exist, storytelling has always been a vital part of our existence. The best stories are the one that paint the most complete picture. Think about your favorite TV show. Would The Wire have been as compelling if it was just about Omar eating Honey Nut Cheerios? Would you have watched Breaking Bad if they cut all the scenes except for the ones with Walt teaching high school chemistry? That's essentially what's happening in journalism, which as a whole is more equal in terms of gender, with 51% identifying as men and 46% identifying as women, but still whiter than a Taylor Swift concert in a jar of Hellman's, with 76% of journalists identifying as white. And that's just information on racial demographics. We also need diversity in socioeconomic background, education level, sexuality, any and everything you can think of so that we can tell more complete stories. So let's dive a little bit deeper into how this lack of diversity was on full display in this incident. But first, I need y'all to know the worldview I'm operating from that I'm sure will get me banned by a school board or two. First of all, this is a white supremacist society. Whiteness as a whole is valued more and we all carry some of that bias inside of us simply because we're here in a country that goes out of its way to ingrain that in us every day. The more aware of this you are, the easier it is to overcome, but it is what it is. That's on a race basis, obviously, but there are other factors at play here. For example, we also live in a male-dominant culture as well as a heterosexual-dominant culture. There are varying degrees of privilege that you will get whenever you fall into one of those categories as well. But whiteness is the standard, the default, the big joker, whatever you want to call it. We live in a white-dominant society. Now, with that in mind, and also with the demographics of sports journalists in mind, I believe there is no greater lens to view the diversity issues within sports media through than the sport of basketball, simply because basketball is the sport that's most closely aligned to the subgenre of black culture that conflicts with your most prominent white supremacist ideologies. I'm talking about hip-hop. Hip-hop is black. It's in your face. It's braggadocious. It's about self-expression. It's vulgar. It challenges authority and societal norms. It's all these things that a white dominant society does not want out of its quote-unquote others. So you have this sport that embodies all these characteristics and you have these journalists covering it who typically don't and it creates this friction that highlights problems in society as a whole. We saw this in how Allen Iverson was covered and how the malice at the palace was covered, which led to David Stern enforcing a racist dress code like a bouncer at damn near every downtown Charleston club. Nothing like leaving your G-unit shoes at home and going to dance to 15 straight Pitbull songs while you're sweating through business casual attire. 
We've also seen it in how black players get framed as being physically gifted, while white players are gritty and crafty, with the implication being that black players were born with whatever made them great and didn't have to work for it, while the white players are smart and hardworking. Most recently, we've seen this play out in the NBA this year with the MVP conversation. Kendrick Perkins made the claim that Nikola Jokic would win his third straight MVP award this year because the majority of MVP voters who are journalists are white, so they'd vote for Jokic over Joel Embiid. J.J. Redick, who is on first take with Kendrick and Stephen A. Smith, was furious, and he got on the show and said definitively that Kendrick was wrong and that white MVP voters were not biased towards white players. Now, it's looking more and more like Embiid is going to win the MVP award, and Perk's argument wasn't particularly effective, but for J.J. to state with such conviction that white voters had no bias was ridiculous. Now, in fairness to JJ, he hadn't heard my talk about whiteness being the big joker and everyone having some level of bias, but let me ask you a question real quick. Name me every single former NBA player who were self-admitted jerks who teammates didn't particularly like at one point in their career, who got a DUI right before their draft, who had a girlfriend sign an abortion contract, who is tatted up and talks openly about their love of battle rap, who was also hired by the worldwide leader in sports and has positioned themselves as an intellectual. If you can name me someone other than JJ Reddick, let me know. And it's not that we should hold all of JJ's past mistakes against him or superficial things like tattoos or musical tastes or whatever against him. In fact, if someone shows signs of growth and self-improvement, we should applaud him. The point I'm trying to make is that JJ's whiteness got him something that money can't buy the benefit of the doubt. He's seen as, despite his past mistakes or anything else, redeemable. And to me, at its core, that's what white privilege is. Treatment that should be afforded to everyone, but is only given to white people to the point where they are blinded by its existence. I believe this is the point Perk was trying to make. You can certainly make the case for Jokic winning his third straight MVP. I mean, the dude's been incredible but he also gets more of the benefit of the doubt than other candidates. Compared to other MVP winners and candidates, we don't put his defense under a microscope. We don't look at his team's lack of postseason success. We don't talk about how voters might be tired of voting for him. He hasn't been held to the same scrutiny as others, so it's fair to question how much of a role his skin tone has played in that because white people love great white basketball players. Now they clown the bad ones, don't get me wrong. And even the good ones are just as likely to get memed as they are to get praised. Shout out to Alex Caruso and Austin Reeves. But the great ones, they love them to death. Because white people are allowed to see greatness in their whiteness. So when they see someone else white doing something great, they identify with that immediately. That player immediately represents them in their mind subconsciously. And honestly, we all do that. Growing up, I naturally gravitated towards black quarterbacks to the point that I actually pulled for Woody Dantzler and Willie Simmons at Clemson, something I'd never consider doing today. To me, the issue is when you're unaware of this bias and you and others who look like you are in charge of the narratives, particularly when your demographic is the most represented in everything. It's hard for you to wrap your mind around the importance of diverse representation and inclusion because nothing teaches you the importance of inclusion like being excluded. Nothing teaches you like bias, like being on the wrong end of it. So you don't question why you like this player that looks like you. You don't question why so many of your colleagues look like you too. And there's a self-preservation aspect to this as well. There's something inside of us that badly wants to believe that all of our accomplishments happen because we earn them ourselves. Our ego needs that. Couldn't be because of some outside factor or whatever. It was all me, I did this. So to admit that someone who I identify with accomplished something with the help of something outside of their control other than their own hard work and dedication might force me to take a look in the mirror and question the validity of my own success. And I can't have that. In reality, admitting something is true or being transparent is rarely detrimental, at least not in a way that is meaningful or long term. I have an easier path to success in sports media because I'm a man. Nobody's gonna come cut my channel because I admit that. And it can't hurt to look a little closer at Jokic's MVP case when he's up for his third in a row. 
something that's only been done one other time since sports writers became the voters for the award in 1981. Magic didn't do it. Jordan didn't do it. LeBron didn't do it. Shaq, Kobe didn't do it. Who did? Larry Bird. Hmm. Never forget Larry Bird said that he found it disrespectful when other teams would try to guard him with another white guy. Never forget that. So we've seen the issues that a lack of racial diversity can cause when it comes to sports media coverage. Let's add in another variable and throw in a lack of gender diversity as well and shift it to women's basketball. Now this is getting fun. We're layering on the blind spots. We've got white sports writers talking about a sport heavily identified with black culture. And now we have men talking about a women's sport. And in most cases, we have white men creating narratives about a women's sport that is heavily identified with black culture. In a vacuum, there's nothing wrong with how Caitlin Clark has been talked about this season. She's an incredible offensive player. She pulls up from the logo to shoot threes. She's got great handles and court vision. She's fun to watch. And she talks miles of shit the whole time she's doing this. However, she has absolutely dominated headlines like white players before her have as well. Sabrina Ionescu, Sue Bird, Brianna Stewart, Elena Deladon, and more importantly, like black players now and before her have not. And this isn't new. I've spoken before about how the WNBA loves to market white players, particularly if they appear more feminine or straight. And I've talked about how the players who don't fit that mold are hyper aware of that. And as you can imagine, the college players who don't fit that mold are hyper aware of it as well. So think about how they must feel when hearing about Clark or Haley Van Lith or the Cavender twins when they're like, hey, I respect their game, but who's respecting ours? Instead, they get this white bias along with this male bias that doesn't have a great understanding of how to talk about the women's game or the idea that equality for women doesn't necessarily mean talking about their sport in the same way that you would talk about a men's sport. And I'm guilty of this too. Not every woman is overjoyed to have her role described as big man. If I'm being honest, big woman ain't that great either. There are just certain ways to phrase things that I'm still trying to learn myself. So if you're not aware of your implicit male bias and then we throw on a white bias on top of that too, you're really just on a path to insulting the black women of the sport in a multi-dimensional way. Then you add in all the stuff from our society as a whole where white men hold the most power, white women are the most coddled, and black women are the most disrespected, and you have a recipe for what happened after the Women's National Championship game. And it had kind of been building too. It was starting to bubble to the surface pregame after Iowa upset South Carolina to make the National Championship game. Dawn Staley talked about the issue she had with how her Lady Gamecock's physical style of play had been described all season by both opposing coaches and the media. A lot of the language used is similar to what you would hear about black male athletes that discredits their actual skill level. And on top of that, there was a lot of language that stripped away the femininity of black women, characterizing them as like brutish, animalistic beasts similar to how people used to talk about Serena Williams when she was kicking everybody's ass. Black women's bodies are usually either hyper-sexualized or hyper-masculinized in a way that we would rarely talk about a white woman or a white woman athlete because white femininity is the standard because white is the standard, so they're feminine by virtue of being white. So you've got the over-the-top Clark coverage, you've got the Dawn Staley comments, and now we've added to the Clark legend with her defeating the undefeated Lady Gamecocks, who we all thought were unbeatable. And we've got highlight reels and compilations of Clark trash talking and taunting opponents to show how much of a competitor she is. And on top of all that, we've got Clark, the white superstar, playing on a predominantly white team in a state, Iowa, that's nearly synonymous with whiteness in the Midwest. This was like a remake of Hoosiers, except there was one game left against LSU. Their star player, Angel Reese, has had an incredible season of her own and, like Clark, lets opponents know as she's doing it, but unsurprisingly, it's not characterized the same. She's not seen as a competitor or passionate or confident. She's arrogant, out of control. She lets her emotions get the best of her. She's black, and so is the majority of her team. This was the Hoosiers remake. Caitlin, Monica, and McKenna versus 
Angel, Ladeja, and Flage, who blurs the basketball hip hop line even more as she's an up and coming rapper herself and daughter of late rapper Camouflage. I told y'all about white people seeing other white people doing something great and identifying with that. They see themselves in that player. Larry Bird embodied white people to white people, even if he was insulted when another one of y'all guarded him. Caitlin Clark embodies white people to white people as well. Caitlin Clark was also the embodiment of white people in the white media to LSU. They were clearly aware of the role this white male dominated sports media played in the Caitlin Clark legend and in the difference in the coverage that they received, that other black players received, and that other black teams received like the Lady Gamecocks. So if they couldn't shift the narrative or be in control of it, they were going to set out to poke holes in it. And they did. Angel, Ladeja, and Flage were incredible. Alexis Morris defended Caitlin Clark about as well as you can and was automatic from mid-range towards the end of the game. And Jasmine Carson came off the bench in the second quarter with a flamethrower. It wasn't even really close. The big story should have been how bad the officiating was because it was awful. But as we all know, Angel Reese hit Caitlyn with the Tony Yayo, pointed to her ring finger, and that was that. Everything blew up. The same people who were proud about Caitlyn Clark being this cold-blooded, shit-talking competitor all of a sudden flipped and treated her like some delicate damsel in distress in need of literal white knights to come and rescue her. Now, what happened was whiteness wasn't as good as blackness, which is seen as disrespectful enough on its own at times, but then the blackness was also unapologetic about it being better and had the nerve to flaunt it in the face of whiteness. It's similar to the dynamic at play when you see movies remade with actors of a different color. The Little Mermaid can be any race at all. We've already suspended disbelief to the point that we accept that she's a motherfucking half-girl, half-fish princess who lives underwater with singing crustaceans. But when you're used to being represented, you're the standard, the default, whatever, anything that happens that doesn't 100% support that causes an internal conflict. The same thing that won't let people question if bias is at play in coverage of certain players or in what their industry demographics look like. But LSU winning forced people to confront that, though. So to preserve yourself, your ego, your whiteness, your beliefs, you have to start discrediting that win as much as possible. They didn't win the right way. They weren't respectful when they won. Here are the unwritten rules of taunting that I just made up. Shout out to Brian McCann. You use your other beliefs and biases to support the one that's been shook. And then when your industry is 82% white, you have the luxury of getting on camera or on the microphone or in front of your social media following and speaking as though you're an expert in all of these things with little to no fear of repercussions. Because again, everyone looks like you, so they don't really wanna question you because they don't wanna question themselves. If you don't believe it's a race issue, specifically a white people issue, look at the wide range of white people who were on the same side. You've got Keith Oberman, who is awful, using similar language to describe Angel Reese as Dave Portnoy, who is also awful. Politically, these two are at opposite ends of the spectrum. Portnoy is the founder of Barstool Sports, which caters to white Trump-loving frat bros. Oberman hasn't gone 30 seconds without treating criticism of Trump in years. They don't align on anything really outside of being white guys in media who are awful, other than their criticisms of Angel Reese. And again, I'm not even arguing to take away their platform. By all means, let them be publicly stupid. But we need others who don't look like them to be empowered to have a platform so that we have some sort of counterbalance so that we can dive into these issues with more depth and nuance so views like theirs aren't reinforced constantly. There's also this idea that because of who is in charge of the storytelling, white people are the authority on everything which is good for sports media since it's so white, you have this giant pool of experts at your disposal, but it's bad and also ridiculous. Let's take a look at why. 
Okay, so I mentioned how you understand the importance of inclusion and being aware of your biases when you're on the wrong end of those things. But when you haven't included all types of diversity, for whatever reason, doesn't have to be intentional, your talent pool of people who can speak from experience on this wide range of issues is incredibly limited. As a result, you have to resort to using what I like to call Charleston diversity. This is where the diversity box that is checked is maybe a woman, maybe LGBTQ, whatever, but they still have that big joker of being white. To me, this particular situation was racial in nature first with the gender stuff layered in there as well. So I wanna prioritize having someone on who could do a solid race analysis, maybe have them on alongside someone who could speak to gender issues, or here's an idea, just bring on a black woman. Instead, what was being done was the equivalent of having me on to break down issues that lesbians face. And if that sounds absurd, it's because it is. But that's what happens. The white perspective is what's centered even by the most well-meaning, well-intentioned white people. So bring in more diversity and not just in a way that checks a box. Every black person on your channel or whatever doesn't have to be a former athlete. And the black former athletes you hire can play the role of intellectual just as well as J.J. Reddick. The world can handle a black woman Woj or an Asian Adam Schefter or whatever. Honestly, I'd probably prefer that to the actual Adam Schefter. But bring us on and empower us to share our perspectives and let you know when your perspective is a little bit off or where your bias might be coming in at play. Do that, your product will be better. Everything will be better. There has not been a business on earth that has not benefited from more diversity. All right, this has been another episode of Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. If you're watching this on YouTube, drop some of your favorite non-white guy media personalities in the comment. Also, congratulations again to Kobe for beating me in the bracket challenge. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, review, and share, and I will catch you next week.